Well, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak about what's lighting up the eyes of people in the cancer field, both do doing research uh, and those who are providing cancer care, our physicians and our nurses and our pharmacists and social workers. We feel that we are on the, the brink of a fantastic new era, both in discovering more about cancer and in better ways to use it to treat patients each individually for their particular tumor uh, in the context of their particular cells. That's what uh, we call personalized medicine, and that's what I want to tell you a little bit uh, about today. Am I doing something wrong here? Whoops. Okay, sorry. Now it's on my, now it's on my screen. So here's a couple of facts to keep in mind as we have this discussion. Uh, the first is that, think of any drug, statin, that somebody, people in this room I'm sure are taking, aspirin, antibiotics. Uh, on the average, almost any drug will have a tremendous positive therapeutic effect in about a third to a half of the patients who take it. It will have a modest or no effect in another third to a half. And in another third to a half might actually have some degree of toxicity and be of, uh, let, uh, not enough benefit to offset the toxicity. Yet, when you go to the doctor's office with some particular condition and you're treated uh, with that drug, we don't know the vast majority of the time who should get the drug, who's in that third to a half that are going to benefit, who should not get the drug because they're in the third to a half that are going to suffer toxicity without benefit, and who should not get the drug in that other third to a half because the drug's not going to do any good and sometimes it's very expensive. Um, in cancer, uh, that's true also. The problem in cancer is you cannot afford not to give the drug if you don't know who's going to benefit and who isn't, because what's at stake? Death, the life and death of the patient. So we treat, on the average, three to four patients for every patient who's going to benefit, and our drugs, whether or not they benefit the patient, do have a very high toxicity. And this notion of chemotherapy that you know about, where people lose their hair, where people become uh, nauseated and uh, feel sometimes like the cure is worse than the disease is something that's vexed us for a long time. It's what we've called car carpet bombing. Those drugs are designed to kill cells that are growing and dividing and hopefully kill more of the cancer cells that are doing that inappropriately uh, and kill less of the cells that we need to be growing and dividing, for example, to make our blood and replenish our blood cells every day. So. We have, long design, we have long dreamed about the opportunity to find ways to pick out those patients and match precisely the kind of drug that that patient should get for that particular cancer and give only that drug to only those patients who should get it and the other next patient in the door should get uh, a different treatment regimen. And that's what people call personalized medicine. Personalized medicine someday should be applied to everybody for every condition, but uh, for reasons I'm going to tell you, we think that the cancer area is going to be the area where it comes first because of the nature of what cancer is and because of the advances in science and technology that are coming right to our sweet spot uh, for treating cancer. So I got to do a little science for the non-scientists in the room, and as they say at the dentist office, this won't hurt a bit. So what you see uh, there are those two arrows, those are chromosomes. Our, the, all of our genes are arrayed in 23 chromosomes, uh, pairs of chromosomes on our, uh, in our bodies, very nicely lined up in the right order. And whether it's a cosmic ray or something somebody ate, uh, or just age where errors in, in copying our DNA every time we make a new cell, over time, errors creep into this, uh, to this genome of genes. And, this is an individual in whom that error took two genes minding their own business, one in chromosome 9, see in the upper arrow there, and one in chromosome 22 right here. This one called BCR, this one called ABLE, that's just shorthand that people used in the laboratory. BCR is a gene that is on all the time. It's being expressed all the time. It does basic cell maintenance functions, whether the cell is going to divide or not. This uh, gene called ABLE on chromosome 22 is a gene that should only turn on when the body says, I need more white cells. I need more white cells to fight an infection, for example. 
Well, what happened in this error was that this unholy union occurred where the two chromosomes got mixed up and entangled, and out of it came a fused chromosome in which the regulatory part of the gene for BCR became fused to the business end, the working end, of the gene for ABEL. So what happens here? So now, this gene that's only supposed to be doing its work when we ask for more white cells is under the control of a gene that's turned on all the time. So the body just keeps making white cell after white cell after white cell when we need them or not, and that is called leukemia. So this particular form of leukemia, called chronic myelogenous leukemia, was known for many years that every patient who had that disease had this fusion, the so-called Philadelphia chromosome, because uh, it was discovered uh, in uh, Philadelphia. And this is the protein product of that gene, and we found out what that did. I say we, I mean the community at large, uh, that the way it, it stimulates the cell to divide is by altering uh, this particular protein, uh, putting a phosphate group on. These molecules are called kinases, for those who are more scientifically inclined. And people came up using modern chemistry and said, well, I have a, a, a drug. It was called ST571. You may have seen it on the cover of Time magazine. It's now known as uh, Gleevec. Uh, and that drug uh, will sit in the pocket of this protein and shut it down, keep it permanently blocked so it cannot be stimulating white cell division. This kind of fusion occurs only in this kind of leukemia, and this drug should only attack those leukemia cells. This is not going to happen in normal cells. So you get much better therapeutic index. And if you look over the years of our frustration in treating this disease where incrementally we got a little better at treating it, but you had to have a bone marrow transplant to get this kind of survival. And if you looked out over the years, all of these patients eventually died. This is what happened when we had that new targeted therapy, it was called, called Gleevec. So it's much more like precision treatment than the carpet bombing of chemotherapy. And this was hugely exciting, and actually this month is the 15th anniversary of the announcement of the results of treating with this, uh, with this drug. So the idea was we can do that for this disease, why can't we do it for everyone else? And everybody took advantage of the fact that this is also the 14th anniversary this spring of the announcement of the sequencing of the human genome. So if the problem with cancer is that genes are going bad, genes are misbehaving, we know that's the root cause of every cancer, let's just find the misbehaving gene in every cancer that's driving that patient's cancer, make a drug to it, and, you know, Eureka, we'll, we'll cure all cancers. Well, 10 years ago, this was actually done for a form of lung cancer, uh, and uh, this, uh, actually yesterday, was the 10th anniversary of this paper, uh, same idea. Now, though, you can use modern DNA technology and sequence all the genes in everybody's cancer and find a target. They found a target, and they used a drug. And this was what happened in lung cancer before with this kind of lung cancer. People almost never lived a year. We were at a party to celebrate this paper. The two key papers were published here in Boston uh, last night. Um, and uh, one of the women who spoke is a 10-year survivor, perfectly healthy on this drug, who had metastatic lung cancer when she presented. Any time in my training prior to that would have been dead within six months. So these drugs are dramatically important, but you're not reading in the paper that everybody is getting cured of cancer. Cancer death rates are falling, but very slowly. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is, is that despite this wonderful construct and this wonderful approach that we have, uh, life is a bit more complicated. So the idea is when you make a diagnosis, instead of the old way of treating cancer, which is try treatment A because in 10,000 patients somebody said that worked in 5,000, treatment B only worked in 2,000, so we'll try treatment A, and if it doesn't work, we'll move on to treatment B, sort of plan A and plan B. But with the idea of precision medicine, if we knew which mutation was driving this patient's tumor, it might cause us to jump directly to treatment B because it, treatment A would be predicted not to work. That's what personalized medicine is all about. And you can do that in cancer now, and we do this at Dana-Farber and other institutions do it. Every patient that comes in our door, if they give us consent, has their tumor sequenced, their DNA sequenced, to find the mutation. So patient A has mutation A, and we treat with uh, the right drug for A. Patient B has uh, mutation B and so forth, and each, each one gets a customized, personalized 
um, therapy. That's the ideal. Well, what's happened when we've tried that? When we've tried that, we have found out that for many patients, the effects are dramatic, but it's a small percentage of patients in whom we find a mutation for which there's a matching drug, number one problem. Number two, we, just to our distress, we find out the responses are short-lived. Cancer cells uh, are a little bit like bacteria that become resistant to antibiotics. They have all kinds of ways of becoming uh, resistant. So while long-term survival is improved in a subset of these patients, they turn out to be across the board between 5 and 10 percent of patients. So we're still a long way from making this work in everybody. And there are reasons for that, and this is science I'll skip right over. Uh, it's because it's not just the genes and the, and the mutations in the coding structures of the genes. It turns out that cancers also mess up how those genes are organized along chromosomes, how they're wrapped in proteins that keep them open for expression or shut them down, so-called epigenetics. And we also have learned that cancers actively suppress our immune response to them. Our bodies would make an immunological response to most tumors and reject them. And I mean, most of us, tumors are probably happening every day, and we are rejecting them with our immune system. But when a tumor gets clever, one of those tumor cells, it can shut down. And these are, the T cell is the immune cell um, that's fighting off. The tumor cell wants to reject it, but the tumor cells learn how to make molecules that signal our immune cells to shut down and allow the tumor to exist uh, within us. So tumors are not only aggressive in growing, they're also sneaky. And we just have learned what these molecules are using the modern genomics. And one of the most exciting areas of chemotherapy now is to block the agents that the tumor cell uses to shut our immune system down and allow our immune system to do its work. You know, when you give an antibiotic, you don't kill all the bacteria in your ear, in your infected ear. Uh, or in your infected uh, bronchus, you kill enough so your immune system can take over and win the war. And that's what we're trying to do here. And this is also has to be highly personalized because in different patients, different ones of these molecules are being messed with by, different, by the patient's own tumor. So this also has to be customized because these drugs are potent, potentially toxic. So where are we headed? Where are we headed in cancer therapy? is instead of just looking at what I'm calling pathologic anatomy here, looking at just the genes and looking at just the cancer cell and just trying to kill the cancer cell, we're recognizing that that's important, as the mathematicians would say, necessary but not sufficient. And instead, taking a much more holistic view of what's going on in the cancer, that the cancer cells are actually building an organ around them. They're building a home for themselves. They're suppressing the immune system. They actually secrete molecules that stimulate other mediators, other molecules in the environment that we usually use for inflammation to fight infection. They actually use those products to grow, to nurture themselves. Um, they really make themselves a very comfortable little ecological nest in our bodies. And we have to not just get at the tumor cell, but we've got to get at all the mechanisms the tumor cell uses to shut down that nice little ecological niche they make for themselves. And this has been a huge breakthrough uh, intellectually in understanding that we have to do more than just treat the cancer. We have to treat all the things the cancer is doing in the body to make the body a, a nice host for it. So while we've had spectacular but limited success in using genomics to direct and develop better therapies, the future is looking at cancer as a tissue and looking at cancer in the context of the individual patient. What's going on in that patient that is allowing that tumor to survive in that individual patient? And how do we personalize therapies to modify that in the individual in a way that will cause, A, the tumor cells to start dying, and B, to cause the host, the patient, to be able to fight, to enable that patient to use his, own, his or her own mechanisms to fight off uh, the cancer. So this also means that science and cancer medicine are uh, converging, that methods that we used only in the laboratory 10 years ago are now used to make measurements on material, the patient's tumor, the patient's blood in order to get those very precise ideas of what's going on genetically in the patient so that we can individualize therapies. So in the 21st century now, 
A typical patient should have their tumors analyzed for genetic abnormalities. They should be given, remember I say tumors here, not just the cancer cell, that whole tissue that we call a tumor. Given only the drugs specific for their abnormalities, given only the vaccine specific for their abnormalities. And we know now, what has our eyes lit up is that the science and the technological advances are there to do this. This is possible to do. What's going to make it difficult is the logistics and the expense of applying this to every patient in every setting. So we're hoping that our future is bright because we know where we can go and we know how to do it. Uh, we're just going to have to figure out um, how to get it done uh, in the practical setting of our healthcare system. Thank you very, very much.